So everyone is very welcome. My name is Susan Rosney. I'm a public policy officer with Chartered Accountants Ireland, and this is the first of our Ask the Expert series. Uh, you're all very welcome. Every fortnight, I will be inviting an expert to answer your questions on sustainability topics. We're kicking off this series with the topic of climate. For anyone who doesn't know, Ireland has a legally binding target to reach a climate neutral economy no later than 2050. This means that we need to ensure effectively that our entire economic activities will not have a negative impact on the climate. We've committed to having our carbon, our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, which is an enormous ask. And we're constantly being told that this will have a huge impact on all sectors of society, including businesses. Businesses are also being told that they will have to help deliver on these targets but many are still getting to grips with the basics in this new area, which has its own vocabulary and its own jargon. So I'm delighted that Brian O'Kennedy is joining me today. Brian is Managing Director of Clearstream Solutions, which is an international corporate responsibility and supply chain consulting business. Among the many solutions that Clearstream provides are carbon footprinting, environmental compliance, audit and certification, and carbon cost reduction. I know Brian obviously through his work with Carbon Disclosure Project or CDP, which is a global environmental reporting network. Brian, you are very welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Susan. Delighted to be here. A little uncomfortable with the experts tag, but we'll see what we can do. Not at all. It's total nonsense. You're certainly um, certainly an expert when it comes to corporate sustainability. And I wanted to uh, let the audience know that they can ask questions in the Q&A box or in the chat, and I'm going to put them to Brian. But I've been promoting this event in advance, and I got many questions in already. And the first one I was going to put to you, Brian, is something that several people have asked me, not just in the run up to this event, but also kind of over the past couple of years, which is uh, why is climate change important for business? And is this not something that the government really should be controlling through legislation and through regulation and through policy change? And businesses, certainly now after COVID, they have so much else to do. So why is it a business issue? Yeah, um, well, apart from the fact that, you know, businesses are increasingly being measured and driven on the value that they're uh, delivering for society, both for their employees, their customers and, and their investors. Um, I, I think on a personal basis, most business people, um, whether it's being pushed by their, their kids or, or the, the need to fix the issue from a macro perspective, w- would feel... Uh, resonance with the topic. I mean, people understand that. When we started Clearstream, let's say 13 years ago, we used to have to explain to a lot of people what, what climate change was. I think that's that's gone now. In fact, one CEO once told me that this was the, the gobbledygook peddled by climate change loonies. Um, we, we've moved significantly on from there. Um, so I think most businesses and individuals and in businesses recognize the criticality of, of the issue. However, I would say what's happened in the last number of years, probably the last three to four years, is that it's essentially become a competitive issue now for businesses. Um, mm. they're, they're competing for, for talent. So the employees, employees are a very important stakeholder. They want to know what their businesses, that they're working for businesses that are ethical and they're doing the right thing. It's, it's competitive for business. So in terms of looking for new customers, increasingly as part of tenders mm. um, or, or, or RFPs, we're being assa- assessed on, on the performance of, of our sustainability and our carbon performance. And finally, the investors and, and perhaps the, the most, let's say, active or, or, of all are the financial organizations and, and, the, and, the, and the investors who are now trying to align their portfolios uh, with companies that are low carbon, low climate risk, uh, et cetera. So companies' ability to be able to talk knowledgeably and provide valuable insight and data into its carbon position is going to be a competitive issue and is now a competitive issue for business. It certainly strikes me, though, that businesses have so much to be doing that it's a challenge for them even to get up to the starting line. And I got a question from a member who was saying that she spends most of her day firefighting. And the specific questions, and I just wanted to read what she said because I thought it was very telling. She says, "I I get the climate change. It's impossible to avoid now. I get that it's a huge issue, but I spend most of my working day firefighting. I have literally no time to read about this. And she asked, what is the minimum 
that a business owner needs to know? What is the minimum they have to do and how do I do it? So there's three different things in there. Maybe it's the first one is what is the minimum that a business owner needs to know? Yeah, um, a, a, a great question. And I, and I really I feel for a lot of SMEs who are, who are trying to keep up with this rapidly evolving scenario. As I said, it is a competitive issue. Um, but what I would say, for, first of all, is if, uh, if you're going to show any form of success or, or, or change in a business, it's got to be something that you internalize. So you've got to make this business as usual for the business. So find ways of incorporating climate change initiatives or actions or decisions into your everyday business. So it's not something that happens. We do business plus climate change. It's now in part of everything that you do in the business. That's that's what's really important. So that's where it doesn't become an extra chore. It's just embedded. So that's that's okay. a general comment, so almost a mindset. But more specifically, I think companies have to start with some understanding of where they are. So try and get an understanding of what we would say your baseline of your carbon emissions. So even whether that's using this are very useful tools now that the government have published to allow you to do a scope one and scope two, what's called an operational emissions. These, Understand what that the, is. Scope one and scope two. I yes, they, they're your what we call operational emissions. They would be your energy and, and your fuel. So that's that's where you have direct control over those carbon emissions. So so getting an understanding of that's very, very important. So you can track progress then as to whether you're getting better mm. without that understanding of where you are. So at a minimum, organizations mm. should have a, an understanding of where carbon is in their business. Then they can they can start to look at what the improvements might be. And again, like any improvements, we need a plan and we need resources and we need to decide how we're going to do it. So if you're a small business, it may be that you can only focus on once a year trying to do an assessment of the energy in your business or trying to change to more renewable um, solutions. So buying greener is always a big thing. I mean, we've we have three simple, four maybe four simple things that businesses should do: look to reduce first, mm -hmm. um, then to buy greener then to work with their supplier, suppliers and supply chains. And then at the very end of that, if there's a necessary to offset or something, which we can talk about again, but th that's, a, that's a, a simple decarbonization a pathway. So uh, hopefully, hopefully that helps. Yeah. So like it, when we were looking at this in the Institute, uh, we have two premises. One is a uh, building in Pierce Street and the other is Linen Hall in Belfast. For the approach we took in Pierce Street, which I, th uh, I think may also answer the question is that, we, we look to say we have a gas boiler. So that's the scope one emissions. That's the energy that we, that's the carbon we create by burning gas. The second is our scope two is our electricity bill. So that's where we looked at our electricity bills and th those often will tell you how much carbon you are responsible for emitting. So if even in, our, in my own personal electricity bill at home, it'll tell me how many kind of uh, I can't remember. Is it what's it's measured in? You get, you get kilowatt hours, and then you yeah, can easily yeah. get kilowatt hours, and that could be transferred across to to carbon. Very, very simple maths. Very simple maths. Yeah. Um. But and I know there's many debates around. Okay, I could we, we switch to renewable energy suppliers in Church of the Canton, Ireland, but there's many other way. There's many kind of debates about. Oh well, it's not always renewable on the grid. You know, there's still gas being um, burned, etc. But I think is the message there that at least that's the first thing you can do. You to decarbonize, you can switch an energy supplier. And yeah, it, it's a, it's a relatively simple way as as is, is offsetting. We, just to go back to, we would always encourage the first thing to do is to reduce. Okay. Um, reduces the top of the pyramid in terms of where you will get impact because you'll also reduce cost. You'll you'll reduce the the carbon. Um, mm -hmm. So so fundamentally, you want to start with reducing. The mm -hmm. Second thing is exactly what you said is to buy greener. So can I buy electricity that's greener? Can I buy fuels that are greener? Can I buy mm -hmm. materials that are are greener um, or, or more sustainable? However you define that. So that's that's number two. And very clearly, in the case of electricity, your scope, your scope two emissions, mm -hmm. that's a relatively simple thing to do to cut your emissions by purchasing green electricity. There is, however, a finite amount of green electricity um, and ultimately reducing, as I said, is a more effective, um, a, a more okay. effective solution long term. But yes, a, a, an easy way to get your, your carbon mm -hmm. uh, footprint down. Then it gets a little trickier because we have less control. So we're looking at yeah. external scope three issues upstream and downstream mm -hmm. where we may not have control, where we may be only influencing it. It may be suppliers, it may be mm -hmm. partners, it may be the use of our products. So that takes a little longer, a little bit more nuanced and 
uh, we need to think about how we can engage with our with our uh, our value chain partners, our upstream and downstream, to try and reduce yeah. scope three indirect emissions. And the scope three emissions, just so I have that clear, it, that's where you are not in control of what you uh, of the emissions that are associated with how people use your products. So, for example, an oil company most of its carbon emissions are in its scope three because an oil company will drill the oil and sell it to somebody and it's when that other person burns it reduces the emissions that's their scope three emissions yes and, and it's also that's your value chain your scope three emissions so yeah. for a lot of say financial service providers their scope three emissions may be in the team traveling to and from the office or it might be in executive travel abroad that's something that they can map out as well it gets a bit more complicated i think once you move into manufacturing but well, in even in the financials that's a very interesting one because in, and this is where uh, for every company this is going to have an impact so for banks for instance and financial institutions scope three emissions is their loan book their portfolio their investment portfolios so in the context of them looking to reduce their scope three emissions, they're going to have to work with their value chain, with their customers. And that's why they're increasingly asking companies they invest in, what are you doing to reduce your, your emissions? Um, and as I said, this is where the real innovation, where the real engagement comes with your value chain. And there'll be degrees of control. For instance, water, waste, will have a reasonably good level of control over as a scope mm. three item. But there'll be other things where we're really only influencing where the product has been created. So for instance, items that we purchase or how our customers use our products. There are 15 mm -hmm. categories of scope three emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really a journey for most people. They shouldn't be afraid of the size of it. It's really about what you're doing within your scope three emissions to start reducing it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very interesting place for companies to play and to start mm -hmm. to look at how can we work together with our suppliers and our, our, the users, our customers uh, to reduce our emissions. Working together is a really key part, isn't it? Because it's something I've certainly found the you know the past while you know becoming more and more involved in this area. There's no one silver bullet, and there's no uh, there's no kind of use I think in blaming either. It's very much you know you work with your suppliers, your suppliers will help you, you help your suppliers. It's all part of a giant kind of continuum of everybody reducing, everybody reducing their impact. So maybe that's an answer to the question that we had. What, what you need to know, what you need to do. I think what you need to know are, say, the basics of what your impact is. And that's probably going to be your electricity use, your energy use, um, and then this more kind of the wider scope three emissions, how you are impacting on the climate. What you need to do then is look at how you reduce those. And sometimes I found it can be as simple as just asking other people, well, what did you do? You know, and then they can get, you know, having that kind of circle of information exchange sharing and um, that can be a lot in there. And then you get once you're going to get further into that, then you're into, you know, materiality and doing an assessment on, on kind of a materiality assessment of your impact. And, and it's it's slightly more detailed. But I think, no, that, that's fantastic. And it leads me, though, into the question that's just come in in the chat um, in the Q&A, rather, which is what creates most carbon emissions in a business? Is it traveling? We've talked about that. Is it electricity? And here's one interesting one. Would it help if I stopped printing? How much carbon does not printing save? Does that help move the dial on it? So I know people, whenever they talk about having kind of a greener office, they will say, you know, we've moved to paperless. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So what, what we suggest is, again, is, and you, you, you preface this nicely by, by looking at, at both upstream or downstream, but also looking at your own operational emissions. So there'll be things that you can do within your own business, as we said, like reducing uh, what you spend. And that's, you know, changing to more energy efficient light bulbs or heating or materials or, 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 um, uh, or electricity or fuels. So that's all within your operational control. That will have an immediate effect. When it comes to some of the more indirect items, so things that you purchase like paper or IT equipment, and invariably, if you're a services business, like I suppose a lot of the, the chartered accountants businesses would be services, mm -hmm. you're not buying a lot of stuff. So you're, you're not, you don't have a vast supply chain and you're not selling and buying and selling materials. Let's say, unlike a retailer, who's where 90% of their emissions mm -hmm. or, or more are in the products that they buy and sell. In the context of, of, an, of an office environment, they are likely to be things like paper or IT equipment. Um, and yes, reducing, as I said, in any of those cases will, will have a, a big impact. Um, we typically see in a services business, about half of the emissions will be in your scope 
scope one and, 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 and two electricity, depending on the office environment. But mm. if the company is doing a lot of travel, for instance, so business travel mm. and airline travel in particular is a high user of a generator of, of carbon, but yeah. also in paper and materials that are used in the office environment and IT equipment will mm. tend to be the next level of scope three items. They're, they're purchased materials yeah. and purchased materials to drive down your emissions there. Again, it's the same. We either use less or we ask the suppliers who are providing them to us to provide a lower carbon solution. So perhaps mm. re recycled paper is better than virgin paper, but maybe not using paper at all, as I said earlier, mm. eliminate first. And then if you can't eliminate, buy greener is the next step. And if you've done your best day in eliminating and buying greener, um, you mentioned travel. Is it possible to offset your way out of it? Because I know myself, I'm, I'm going to Paris this year, um, which is a, a really looking forward to it. Um, but I'm terribly conscious of the carbon impact that's going to have and the guilt. And yet I shouldn't be doing it. Can I, to reduce my guilt, uh, buy my way out of this with carbon offsets? So, so you can, well, your, your, your guilt is your guilt. We, 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 have a, we, we use the term sometimes that offsets are a little bit like pain for your own sins. Um, however, in this context where we're talking about, about let's call it a luxury item, um, mm. you know, the, we don't want to be preaching to people. There's a lot of positive things that come out of, of travel. Um, there's a lot of positive things that come out of other items that cause high carbon emissions. So we just have to be careful that, that we, we look at a balance. One way of balancing that is by, by offsetting. As I said, preference would be to reduce first, then to buy greener, and then to do a value chain offset, which is, means I work within my supply chain. Mm -hmm. If at the end of that, and you have heard of the term net zero, yes. so we want to try and get as close to zero as possible. In fact, the term should be zero and then net. Because mm. essentially, that's where the offsets come in. We will be left yeah. with residual. Just yeah. to interrupt, what is net zero again? Like I, I, net zero, as I understand it, is where you just you, you basically do more good than you do bad. You're bal it's exactly. how you balance these scales. Well, for yeah. accountants, it's a balance. It's a balance sheet. Okay. We have we have we have as much uh, uh, re removed as we do emitted. So mm. in that context, we have carbon removals or carbon mitigations. In this case, it's a carbon removal that removes whatever we're putting out. And that's the netting piece. Mm. Now, some companies choose to net before they get to the impact. So for instance, we will be netting off in 2050 because the chances of Ireland getting to zero by 2050 are, are minimal. So there will be an investment in terms of netting or whatever that net well, is. I mean, we won't reduce our carbon emissions to zero, but what we will be doing is we'll be trying to get them down to zero where we can't, we're going to be buying Buying, buying or value chain. So there may be other things we're doing. We might be investing in, we might be remediating our, our bogs. We might be sequestering. We might be investing in other projects that are, there might be technologies. I mean, I have a great believer. If I look back 10 years of where we were with carbon, we yeah. didn't even understand it. Now look where, where yeah. we are with the whole conversation. So I think we'll get there with carbon. I'm more worried about biodiversity, frankly, but in the context of carbon, the net may very well mean that we have to pay or invest or yeah maintain something else that's the netting and that's effectively what purchasing a carbon offset is you're yeah. paying somebody else to remove carbon and it may be that you're netting it off for your whole business or mm. it could be in the case of your trip to to france or wherever mm. it could be a project-based offset so okay. we've seen for instance insurance companies offsetting the mm. travel of some of their their customers that's a project-based offset where mm. we buy carbon emissions from somewhere else now yeah. it's a it's a challenging area because the science is still a little fluffy and gray. The area is not very well regulated yet, but it is coming. We are starting to see the regulators put a little bit more focus on that. Gold standard offsets, gold standard whereby you're investing in nature-based solutions. You're investing in something that, like it, it could be batteries. Sorry, this is the, the technology technology offsets where you're investing in maybe battery storage capability, and um, but there's nature-based ones for maybe you're rewilding, you reforesting, yeah. and that's the question. That's pulling carbon out yeah. of the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we would never, we would never yeah. suggest, and companies shouldn't. Frankly, they shouldn't do it. This idea of carbon neutral petrol, or it's absolutely nonsense. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. What they should do is they should stack that as one of the issues. So they need to I'll go back to it again. They need to reduce first, then buy greener, 
then look to offset within their mm-hmm. value chain, so work with their suppliers. And only then, finally, at mm-hmm. the end, when they've lots and lots of stuff like that, let's start talking about paying for our guilt the offset. Uh, at that point. Buying let's, an let's yeah, uh, it used to be called purchasing carbon credits. And, yeah, and the other yeah. thing about some of them have really excellent what I'd call community or social mm-hmm. or, or developing world. Frankly, the people mm-hmm. in the developing world are the ones that are probably going to suffer most mm-hmm. from our excesses in terms of carbon. So it, it would seem to make sense in that context for carbon offsets to be supporting mm-hmm. some of the development. I'm not, a, I'm not a subscriber that our offset should be at home. I, I actually think mm-hmm. the planet yeah. is the planet. Um, so so th- there's often an opportunity for us to, to build in an element of a charitable um, yeah. program into S- our offset. ESG, yeah, ESG, exactly. environmental social governance, this is the exactly. S part, so it's very Think of it as a wider. Um, I'm coming to the end of the time, but I, I got a question here, uh, which I thought was very good. In the example of the accountancy firms, are there clients in scope three? And the firm has an interest in encouraging clients to drive down emissions in order to improve their impact. That may be a question about the maybe the public interest, uh, the charge of the accountants acting in the public interest. Is this part of it? Um, in that case, so just to repeat that, accountancy firms, the clients in a way, would they be considered their scope three emissions? I, I, or is that not no we don't we don't see it. no we have no we haven't seen we haven't seen accounting firms measure that i would say to the end of the day you know so the guidelines greenhouse gas protocol would not have in, would not include uh, your customers in that context because there's the product the use of the, the sole product is unless unless you counter the paper that you hand over to them their annual uh, accounts or whatever but that would be would be minimum so the use of the sole product in this case is not is not counted however it might be that there's an opportunity to engage with your scope mm-hmm. three or your value chain in terms of learning or awareness mm-hmm. or work together on a program that will help their customers. Mm-hmm. So we see a lot of that, particularly in, for instance, in the insurance industry, mm-hmm. where in theory, insurance investments are scope three, but insurance premiums are not. But we very often see insurance companies engaging with their customers mm-hmm. on decarbonization projects. So knowledge, yeah. expertise, mm-hmm. experience. Just because it's not strictly in your footprint or counted for in scope three doesn't mean that there isn't a valuable engagement uh, in the process. And in theory, like obviously your customers traveling to and from your premises, again, not necessarily in it, but you might want to provide them with electric charging units or you know, encourage encourage them to do the right thing when they're coming to visit you and give them yeah. the you know location of all the, the nearest public transport so it, yeah, there's yeah. lots of ways to engage with customers on 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 the car in the carbon world that may not necessarily fit specifically into your scope one two and three inventory that's fascinating actually i'd never thought about that is if you were if somebody's visiting your premises have a charger there because it's something that we're actually doing the next, not next week, the week after, and um, that session is going to be on electric vehicles. And we've somebody from uh, SEAI, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, to talk about grants and some uh, a motoring journalist, Geraldine Herbert, who's going to be talking about answering questions about EVs. And but that's a really good tip, actually, because we're going to be talking about range anxiety. So if somebody's coming to your premises and you have this there, I know it's not going to sway them in their decision necessarily to buy an EV. But if everybody is doing that, that's something that will help. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and it, it's, it does. It does a number of things. It tells them that you're engaged in like if I was to be commercial or competitive about it, you know, yeah. it tells them that you're engaged in that. It shows yeah. them you're willing to give up some space to to provide them with, with, and you're encouraging them to do the right thing. So, so when you look at scope three or external value chain, think of think of how this can benefit their value chains. And that's the, the big question now. We saw a lot of focus from, from companies on, what are you doing yourself in the initial phase? What are your own internal emissions, one and two? The change now is that what companies are increasingly being asked is, how are you going to be able to help me yeah. to reduce my emissions? So if you're a supplier to me, tell yeah. me how, your work or efforts or product or solution is going to help me to reduce mine. And that's creeping into government procurement where we're being asked to provide social impact measures. We're being asked to talk about the carbon in the products that we're selling. We're being asked to, talking about the impact that our products are going to have on our customers' carbon. That's a really interesting space. A lot of opportunities there for us all to say, how can we help our customers and our suppliers to reduce their emissions? 
Okay. Look, I think that's a really good note to leave, to leave it on. How do we help? How do we help our clients, our customers reduce their emissions? But obviously, we start with our own as well. We look at getting our own house in order. And the message certainly that I think you, you, you've made very clearly, Brian, as well as reduce, reduce effective energy management, reduce your use of things. Uh, as a very last resort, consider offsets, but certainly reduce. And then it's kind of a, a many, many. Uh, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. I ask the question yeah. and people ask, is, oh, is it not more expensive? It, it's not if you ask the question early enough. If you tell, tell your suppliers that, you know, next year and the year after, we're going to want the greenest product, start your journey. And, and then they'll start competing on who's going to bring you the greenest solution rather than asking them after the effect. And then you, mm. you're going to see higher prices. So, yeah, buying green can be something we call it the power of the PO, um, power of the purchase order. If you can get yeah. your suppliers... And very often for many of us, that's the most, the, the, the biggest impact that we can yeah. have, if not the most immediate one to have, the biggest impact we can have is how we spend our money. Absolutely. No, listen, that has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Brian. It's been great to talk to you as always. I look forward to, um, to talking again in the future. And for anybody joining us today, we have, as I mentioned, another event uh, coming up on the 23rd of February on EVs. And we look forward to seeing everybody there again. Brian, thank you very much. And thanks to Chris, my colleague in Chartered Accountants, Ireland, thanks, for facilitating. Take care, everyone. All the best and be green.